Welcome to The Threat Show, powered by Fletch. There's this pretty famous research that says you can re-identify 87% of the U.S. population using only their date of birth, their gender, and their zip code. Wow. When I bring that up with customers, they're like, what? <laughs> they're just shocked. And if you think about it, it's a pretty unique group of information for a person in the United States. And then if you connect that with our troves of public open data, now you can re-identify those individuals. So this is kind of the basis for like credential attacks. Anytime you see the multi-factor authentication where you're like, well, what's your mother's maiden name? I just die inside. Hi, and welcome to The Threat Show, powered by Fletch. I'm Darian Kinlan, VP of Technology. Our co-host, Chris Wilder, is traveling back, I believe, from RSA. So he'll be joining us next week. But this week, we're joined by special guest Graham Thompson, founder and CEO of Privacy Dynamics, a data anonymizer built for innovative and ethical data teams. They believe that ethics, data insights, and personalized technology can coexist to support business growth and customer privacy simultaneously. Privacy Dynamics uses state-of-the-art methods to save data engineers time, reduce exposure to risk, and maximize the utility of anonymized data. Before founding Privacy Dynamics, Graham worked for Microsoft in a variety of roles, from helping Azure developer relations and civics technology to spearheading privacy research engagements with Microsoft Research. He also spent time working at Apple, Alpine Investors, and several other companies within the tech industry. Welcome to the show, Graham. Thanks, Darian. It's nice to be here. So we'll be talking with Graham about data anonymization and his advice for protecting small and medium-sized businesses in a bit. But first, let's run through the threat landscape and the numbers for the week. So it's interesting. This is RSA week. You'd think that it would be a crazy amount of activity, and that's kind of true. A lot of things make the headlines. But in terms of the threat landscape, it's actually kind of flat. We saw a number of threats pop up and a number that got retired overall. The total amount of threats that we're tracking for the week is relatively flat for this time period, which is, you know, interesting data point in and of itself. When we dig into the actual numbers, we see that roughly 22 threats have emerged, which is actually pretty surprising, but a number of them actually went inactive, meaning we haven't seen any new activity around these threats in the past roughly 30 days. Overall, not that surprising, considering all of the buzz that's going on with different coverage by all the different media outlets due to RSA. But let's take a look at the interesting threats we found for the week, nonetheless. In terms of the different types of threats that seem to be dominating the headlines, it's really a focus around supply chain attacks and various updates to ransomware operations, new malware, and a change in tactics for at least one Iranian threat group. When we look at the first one, Medusa ransomware is actually an exercise or an example in a type of ransomware group that's been around for a while now, and they've actually engaged in what appears to be a triple extortion operation, which we kind of alluded to in last week's show, when ransomware groups first steal small and medium-sized businesses' data, they usually hold it for ransom to basically deny access for the, the target or victim to not be able to access their data. And uh, that's one form of ransom, right? Denying access to your data. And the second form is usually selling that data on the dark web. Well, now there's a third form of extortion, which is, you know, paying them to not publicly disclose what they've stolen. And that's exactly what's happened here. Medusa Ransomware is now leaking details of the source code around what they managed to compromise from infrastructure owned by Microsoft, specifically around Bing and Cortana source code. So this does happen and it's happening more frequently, which is a pretty worrying site. So when you're trying to think about the cost and risk of ransomware, you really need to be thinking about all three different levels of this of this type of operation. Certainly, you know, Microsoft has one of the best security teams on the planet to be able to minimize this exposure, but obviously for small medium-sized businesses, getting hit with something like Medusa ransomware can be pretty devastating for a lot of business operations. Moving on, the next group that we've looked at is actually a change in a type of nation-state threat group backed by Iran called 
APT35, also known as Ajax Security Team. I think Microsoft used to call it Phosphorus, and then they went and did a slight name change there. In this particular case, what's interesting about this threat is that they originally were slow moving, but now they seem to have ramped up operations targeting US critical infrastructure and likely other related industries pretty soon thereafter. What's most surprising about this threat group is that they've now demonstrated an ability to weaponize near zero day or end day vulnerabilities to actually conduct attacks and operations within roughly five days of the proof of concept code being available. That's actually a pretty interesting change in their tactics and their ability to move quickly, which suggests that they're ramping up operations to go after other industry verticals in the future. Third on our list is actually a new type of malware that was discovered by uh, researchers over at Cybel, where they looked at a new type of information stealer built specifically to go after Mac OS users. Now, generally speaking, the Mac OS ecosystem is not as rich of a target, but we're seeing more and more Mac-based malware starting to enter the fold. And this is a prime example of that. Still, even with all the different sophistication that's available within this particular type of malware, it still requires some sort of user to actually go through and do an installation user interaction. So one of the best advice that you can provide to your, your employees is to just not install any software that looks sketchy or is not from a trusted source. It still requires the user to actually do something in order to get compromised. But that said, this malware is going after a whole host of cryptocurrency wallets. So if any portion of your business uh, involves cryptocurrency, this could be a pretty sizable target for this particular attacker. Fourth on the list is actually a new type of malware found specifically going after enterprise networks. So Infoblox Threat Intelligence Group managed to uncover a particular type of malware called decoy dog. And what's interesting about this is actually they have not only gone after and compromised enterprise organizations successfully, but one of the unique attributes of this particular malware is going after and using DNS as a means of command and control, not just traditional usage of DNS, but unique usage where it's similar to domain name generation algorithms, as previously mentioned a couple of years back. In this particular case, it's gotten a lot more sophisticated and it's much more difficult to identify and track this sort of activity. So from a small medium business standpoint, this is probably not a threat worth concerning yourself with around it. But if you are a larger organization, you definitely want to take a look at this in more detail, just because the tactics that are used here are certainly going to be copycatted by future threat groups based off of this initial success. And then last on our list for the week, we actually have a new update related to the Lazarus supply chain attack that was discussed a couple of weeks back. If you recall, the VoIP vendor 3 cx was originally compromised and the attackers managed to go in and lace malware in 3 cx binaries that were then used by their customers unwittingly allowing the attacker to then compromise those other victim organizations. It turns out that as part of the investigation Mandian conducted, they found that 3CX themselves were the victim of an earlier supply chain attack. In fact, the original compromise came from a third party company called Trading Technologies with a particular program that C3X was using called XTrader. And so because Trading Technologies was compromised and 3CX was actually a customer of Trading Technologies, when they used the latest XTrader software package, well, that compromised C3X's entire supply chain, which then compromised all the corresponding victims. So this is the first example that we've seen publicly about how a two-stage supply chain attack has actually caused major harm across seemingly two or multiple different industry verticals. And it's likely not going to be the last time we see this. This is actually 
going to become more and more common, which is a problem for a lot of organizations that rely on trusted partners to do their work. One of the interesting things about this, honestly, is you know, how do you limit access to this sort of data? And this is a great way to kind of talk a little bit more about data segmentation in general when trying to protect against supply chain attacks. So Graham, I'm curious from your perspective, is the reason why most organizations don't have good data segmentation is because it's hard or it's expensive? I'm curious your, your thoughts here. Yeah, well, I think the costs of it go beyond just the cost of sort of building that data environment, right? The costs can be associated with limiting an employee's ability to do their work or the time that it takes to prepare, you know, data that you would consider safe. So that like we look at costs as a kind of a multi-dimensional aspect of why someone would use something that resembles closer to production data in these development environments. And so I think as we look at that from a privacy perspective, the cost can also be the reduction in the utility of the data. So if I strip out a bunch of fields that I am considering sensitive, well, it limits my engineer's ability to sort of do their work. And so it just cascades from there too. So as we look at concepts like data minimization and reducing access to, to production data, those costs are just all over the place. And, and so as we think about that from a privacy perspective, how do we minimize those costs while still allowing companies to do interesting things and, and move at the pace that we're now used to in the development side of the business? Right. And from an engineering perspective, it's not easy for, let's say, a high growth startup or maybe a medium sized business to consider investing in what is traditionally enterprise privacy engineering, where you have people actually go in and do a full analysis of, yeah. okay, what is our customer data? Where does it live? Who needs access to what specifically? So I think what a lot of our audience is probably wondering is, gosh, these supply chain attacks are happening more and more frequently. We know we need to do something. We know that this is a hard problem. You know, what are some practical steps that they can take to yeah. try to move the needle here? Yeah, I was, I'm laughing because I was thinking about the number of times the door has been slammed in my face walking into an engineering team at a startup and then talking about anonymizing their data. There's definitely friction and it's palpable when you when you see the friction between a security or a privacy team or compliance team and an engineering team because it's always seen as something that it's going to slow me down. It's going to reduce my ability to do my work. And so techniques are getting better. We're starting to see encryption tools being a little bit easier to use and less costly. You're seeing some like vault based tools that are think I think are really cool for like tokenization and vaulting, We're seeing some differential privacy stuff actually come into like commercialization and then also like synthetic data and dev and test data specifically. So I think as we get better and better at these specific privacy technologies for each individual use case, one of the biggest ones is just getting realistic data that looks and feels and acts just like production into development environments. These development environments are exploding across, you know, whether they're these remote dev environments. I was at KubeCon in Europe and Amsterdam last week, and the growth of these remote dev environment companies like Octeto, Release, Garden, mm -hmm. Gitpod, they're becoming very, very popular. But as, as you think about those, those are each individual development environments that are all now containing what could be sensitive data. <laughs> so the problem is getting wider, like bigger, really, really fast. I think for us, our focus is, can we give those developers data that they could hardly tell the difference between the data that we, we give them and the production data? And now that conversation with security becomes a lot easier. It's interesting. We, we talk about how a lot of DevOps teams are trying to shift left, try to get earlier into the design phases of introducing better security controls and mechanisms. It seems like the best way to kind of make progress on this, just like when you're trying to eat a whale, you don't <laughs> eat it all at once. You try to uh, chip away at it one chunk at a time. It, it seems like that might be a decent philosophy here when you're trying to introduce data anonymization, tokenization, rather than trying to revamp or retool everything all at once, maybe segmenting it up, you know, start with yeah. small workloads, small use cases, slowly start to change or anonymize certain fields or certain data and see what the impacts are to the business from a usability perspective.
it's a hard problem, but clearly supply chain attacks are going to continue and grow in increasing risk for the foreseeable future. I don't see that changing. Yeah. And especially with the need to bring on, as you mentioned, third party contractors that are slowly starting to use more and more sensitive data. There's just more pressure added yeah. to the mix. It's not going to go away, right? If you look at the world too, there's more and more personal data being created. The pace is just incredible how fast we're generating new data about unique individuals. And the more that that's present and the more opportunities we have to use that data in interesting ways, the threats just compound. It's something that we definitely need to get a grasp on, but you're absolutely right when you say like, you can't eat a whale. This concept of data minimization and a lot of like CPRA and HIPAA and GDPR and even the ISO 27001, they all talk about only having access to sensitive data when you need it for as long as you need it and only by you know who needs it. If you did that across a large organization, it would almost be impossible to get anything done because you would reduce access to everything they need. But I think this, this idea of just taking on the little projects, like if you have a, a development project that you know doesn't need anything close to production data, but it's just a quick project, like how do you get data from production into that environment? Even like privacy aside, are you just redacting columns? Great. But you can take these little baby steps toward this kind of holy grail called data minimization. And I think each individual step that you take can demonstrate another responsible way that you're managing your customer sensitive information. Absolutely. I mean, what's interesting is that it seems like there's parallels here to what a lot of CISOs would describe as data classification policies, right? Where you don't try to apply stringent security controls to every aspect of data in your business. Instead, you try to apply reasonable controls based off of the sensitivity of certain types of data. They like to use the color code mechanism of green data, yellow data, and red data. Hey, that's we, we love colors, right? So similarly, maybe one of the practical ways that engineers could think about this is to identify, okay, what data is okay to be anonymized that won't affect the business, won't affect business functions, what data needs some level of accuracy in there where maybe you can you know, anonymize it some of the time, but not necessarily all the time. And then what is data that is absolutely critical to a particular function that, hey, you can't change it, you can't alter it because this particular function or use case or operation just will not work, right? If you can kind of bucketize it into those three areas, you can start to have reasonable conversations with your engineering team about, okay, how can we deal with this and secure this data one chunk at a time as opposed to everything everywhere yeah. all at yeah. once, right? And that's just going through that process, you're now demonstrating compliance with a lot of the privacy regulations that are out there. You, you're showing that you're thinking about minimizing access to sensitive data based on use case. And that alone is a lot more than many folks do. Right. You know, I'm curious if you've got someone who is maybe a army of one doing security operations, or maybe they've got a small team of like two or three people and they're having a tough time explaining the importance of this to their engineering teams. Do you know of any good resources that they could potentially seek out or, or leverage to help further the conversation and yeah, try to raise the bar? It changes as companies mature and, and get bigger. You know, startups rarely have a CISO. Right. There's, you know, security startups are a little bit more commonly do, but most tech startups don't have a CISO. They don't have a compliance person. They don't even really have like a dedicated DevOps, you know, platform engineering person. Mm -hmm. And so you're kind of relying on this, like in our sort of mission statement, it talks about like ethical and responsible use of data. And you're relying on the, and trusting that I believe, and I'm an engineer by background, like I believe engineers are good people. Like they're sure. in the world to do something positive, aside from a lot of the articles that we right. just read about, but they're largely good people. And we believe they like try to do the right thing, but they often, they're also focused on being efficient and, and we will fight to our own detriment to be efficient with process. And so if, if privacy or, or security process gets in the way and something else is a higher priority, it gets left behind. And so doing the simple thing, like picking the simple thing to get through and produce data they can use is, is a good first step. I think I would say as resources, certainly 
just playing around with identifying risk. There's some really good research papers that a lot of them you can find through our website and through our docs. I don't want to like stand up here and just sell all the resources that we have available. We do, we do have a sure. free tool that people can play around with too. But I think just learning about the risks. So there's, there's this pretty famous research that says you can re-identify 87% of the U.S. population using only their date of birth, their gender, and their zip code. Wow. Uh, when I bring that up with customers, they're like, what? <laughs> they're just shocked. And if you think about it, it's a pretty unique group of information for a person in the United States. And then if you connect that with our troves of public open data, now you can re-identify those individuals. So this is kind of the basis for like credential attacks. Anytime you see like the multi-factor authentication where you're like, well, what's your mother's maiden name? I just like die inside <laughs> because you can find all that information. And so I think it's pretty amazing that when we generate more and more data, those, those attacks are more common. So, I mean, even resources, like just reading some of the privacy research papers once in a while as, as casual reading can be really helpful just to think about the different attack vectors that you can re-identify information with. It's interesting. I think a lot of enterprises, what they'll try to do is identify small engineering projects that were successful at deploying data anonymization, tokenization, and then kind of build a best of breed of, oh, hey, here are some examples of code where we've done this successfully to then provide to engineering teams where they don't necessarily have to build everything from scratch. It's more like they've got something that they can use as a foundation to build off of and, and grow it. A lot of times that's a big aspect of it is just how much time is involved on the engineering side of being able to shim in this new thing and still accomplish business objectives in a reasonable time. That's a big part of the challenge here. That's actually one of the biggest learnings that I had to go through. I mean, imagine I'm doing privacy research at Microsoft, mm -hmm. right? Like facilitating a lot of the privacy research and the timelines for these are years. And they right. can go to the depths of the earth on their research. And that, like, that's what we wanted. And so I go from that to a startup with no resources <laughs> and trying to build tools for some, imagine my mindset. My mindset was, we are going to be the most sophisticated privacy technology you've ever seen. And we go to customers and they're like, I just need the data fast. <laughs> like, that's, that's great. You just rattled off all these stats. Like I just, I just need an easy way to get data. And so we really had to focus on just that, like make it really easy. And I underestimated how important that was for engineers and not trying to boil the ocean, but just get a little bit better and then get a little bit better. And that's a good path. If you're an early engineering team and you want to start focusing on privacy, don't try to do too much too fast. Yeah. I think one of the core tenants that I've seen work really well is if you're giving an engineer a problem to solve, and again, they've got good intentions. And they've got many different paths to accomplish that objective, right? Well, if you can make the default path, the easy path, be also the secure path, chances are they're probably going to take that. Yeah. But if it's not easy, absolutely, it's, it's going to be very difficult to actually get momentum and implement. It, it goes a long way. That initial investment of just, hey, here's some reference implementations or examples can really help kind of move the needle on these initiatives. And if you think about this trade-off, the lowest hanging fruit is probably the cause of these supply chain attacks too. Yeah. If you've got a hundred data projects going or engineering projects, the last one on the list is probably the, the one that the supply chain attacks are going to come through. Absolutely. Well, in terms of other success that I've seen in the data anonymization, tokenization space, has really been driven by compliance efforts, as you mentioned. The biggest one probably is PCI compliance, where you're processing payment cardholder data and you want to remain compliant, but you want to be able to do all these fancy stats. Like if you're a medium-sized retailer and you want to be able to figure out what people are buying and what to recommend to them, you kind of need to know a lot of this information that's very sensitive. But does that mean you necessarily need to know their credit card numbers? No, you don't. Yeah. And it's really about like, okay, where is that fine line? And it would be great if there was like a one size fits all model for every single industry. But unfortunately, I think what a lot of teams realize is, eh, it depends. It depends yeah. on what you're trying to achieve, right? Honestly, when I push on that, that question with Mark, it's, it's always marketing. I'm not throwing shade at the marketing <laughs> folks out there, but it's always the marketing advertising teams. They're like, no, I need to know the individual person. 
And I'm like, do you, do you actually? And I'm not even close to the most hip person in the room, but I'm not unique. I'm not in the world as a shopper. It, it'd be pretty hard to be unique. There's always right. someone out there that is similar in terms of buying decisions and behaviors as you. If we can find those people and group you with them, that is, I think, one of the most powerful forms of privacy that still maintains the utility of the data. And so that's this, like the clustering method, which is one of the, the oldest methods called, based on K anonymity. It's all about just finding the similar folks in the database and then making minor adjustments. So I mentioned the date of birth, gender, and zip code thing. If you mm -hmm. find someone that's very similar to me and their birthday is a month off, like take the median of our birthdays and change both of our birthdays to that date. Now as a shopper profile, it's very similar, but it's not unique. And I always push marketing teams to think in terms of profiles and clusters as opposed to individuals. And then you get these vault-based solutions that you can keep the email address for their vault, but you can build everything off a profile and then when you do need to send an email, it's just on an isolated system that that vault maintains. So right. like building the profiles is is more where we live. And then the, the vault-based system is Skyflow's probably, I, I like them a lot. I think they're doing some really interesting things. You'd use someone like that to reconnect back to the email address and get that mail out. So it is possible. You have to architect it a little bit, but you can imagine all the marketers and sort of analysts that are building out those models, they don't need access to the customer data to do it. I think you bring up a really valid point, which is if you're targeting individual customers, chances are you're engaged in something that doesn't scale. Yeah. <laughs> There's no way a marketing team can justify building an entire marketing campaign around one individual. Like yeah. it just, it's not realistic. So yes, absolutely. Clustering. Selling building. airplanes. Right. Well, yeah, sure. Yeah. Like, yes, if the price tag of the thing you're selling yeah. is now like millions of dollars or billions of dollars, then yes, you can afford to do that. But chances are for a small and medium sized business, that's not going to be the yeah. case. Right. Yeah. But a lot of the interesting wins that come out of this sort of effort are quite powerful. I mean, you mentioned getting certifications accomplished in a matter of months as opposed to years, just because yeah. of this effort that for many businesses in many industries, that's a huge motivator right then and there. I mean, yeah. suddenly you can do business with a whole bunch of other potential partners or customers that you never even could before simply because you've now adopted this new model. So clearly there's more than just being a good internet corporation or citizen, right? But there's clear business motivations in moving in this direction. I'm yeah. curious from your perspective, what other motivations or wins or benefits have you seen from, from customers that go down this path? Yeah, well, I think we're at a really interesting time with data sharing right now. So we've mm -hmm. had sort of the cookie wars lately and a lot of sort of data becoming coming back to first party. So the, the war on cookie-based identity that we're sort of at the tail end of and, and people are starting to rethink how they build their partner data environments. So you're, mm -hmm. we're seeing a lot more like take second party data. Well, you still have to have to have a lot of trust with that data partner, right? You're handing over a database that may contain customer information and you're yeah. still liable if that information gets breached. So if it's my customer and I share it with you and you lose it, that's still my customer and I'm responsible as it relates to privacy regulation. And so we have to trust each other, but I also have to ensure, like if I tell you the data has been de-identified and it's free to use and you go share it on the open web, you didn't do that intentionally. You thought, hey, you told me the data was de-identified, but you did a poor job with it. And suddenly there's right. a breach. And so now we all look bad. It's really hard to understand too. Like the hardest thing in, in privacy is this re-identification risk because you don't know what other information someone has. I often use the, the analogy of if you started to give my mother information about me, she would get it pretty quick. She'd be like, I know who that is. And it can be generic information that could belong to a lot of people, but that's still a disclosure of my private information. Like say there was health information in there. And so this re-identification risk, I think is really interesting on how we measure that and how we run sort of attack simulations on what other information could be available, how likely is an attacker to be able to gain access to the identity of this record. And I think the better we get at doing that, we'll come back out of this sort of low point that we're in on data sharing and people will start to share data more freely with partners and do exciting things. Especially, I think the health tech space is really ripe for this. FinTech too, 
you're seeing companies start to, I call it like the democratization of financial products, where before we'd mm -hmm. use Bank of America for like every product. And now you're seeing all these companies serve the market in unique, interesting ways that requires data sharing. So I'm pretty excited about a lot of those, but it all comes on like building this responsible and robust framework for sharing data in a safe way. Yeah, we've talked about a lot of the different motivators from the carrot perspective. I certainly would be remiss if I didn't talk about the motivators from the stick perspective, which is, you know, what are the regulations that you see coming down the pipeline that seem to be pushing businesses to start to adopt these controls, even if they don't necessarily want to? I think, yeah. you know, with EU's GDPR, that was a huge one. California's new privacy laws certainly appear to be leading the pack. But I'm, I'm curious if you've seen other types of regulation, maybe industry specific regulations start to move the needle where it's no longer hey, this is a nice to have, but no, you can't do business unless you have this certain capability in place. Yeah. The other challenge is there's so many. You can talk right. to a pretty mature company and they're like, yeah, I checked off most of them, but it's very reactive. I think in terms of like the most exciting updates and progress that on that side, going from, I was helping with enterprise readiness at Microsoft when GDPR was kind of coming online. So imagine this intersection, we were trying to get customers to use Azure and compute with like the new ML stuff. Like ML was the buzzword then. At the same time, GDPR was taking shape. This is like 2015, 2016. Wow. And we're like asking big customers to spend millions on some of the new ML stuff on Azure. And they were like, yeah, but what if GDPR shuts it all down? <laughs> and so that's what started all this privacy research. And fast forward to like when GDPR hit, it was a total, it was kind of a dud, right? Like people were freaking yeah. out about it. And then it came out and people were like, oh, well, that didn't change anything. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. uh, it changed behavior a little, but there were no big sticks that people were getting hit with. Even like Facebook got fined and it was some like trivial amount compared to the amount of money they made with the data. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that actually impacted the fear of the stick for all the privacy laws afterwards hmm. and all the changes to them afterwards. And now we're starting to see like, so CCPA, the old California privacy law, just had an amendment and now it's CPRA. And there's still a lot of confusion about changing the name, I think was a mistake. But so now CPRA actually has an agency in place to enforce the law. And oh, wow. they defined it a little bit further. And they actually added some re-identification risk language that is similar to what's been in HIPAA for a long time. HIPAA was probably the easiest one to know if you're compliant with HIPAA because right. there was two paths. There's, I can satisfy the requirement from safe harbor. I can take out these values. I can annualize dates, whatever. Or I can get an expert to give me a certification. Well, the safe harbor one is really hard to address because dates being annualized for any health tech company is kind of a joke. I want to know what you did this morning, not what you did last year. Right. And for the expert determination stuff, it's a static data set that takes months for an individual or a team of PhDs to go through. So that doesn't work for a modern engineering team either. But the basis of that was actually really helpful for us. We worked pretty closely with this guy, Dr. Brad Mullen at Vanderbilt, and he wrote the guidance on it for HIPAA, for de-identification. And it's all like K-based approaches of can you attack and identify an individual? Could you re-identify them? Right. So I think seeing that language now come into CPRA is exciting because it actually gives people a framework to build around to say, okay, I'm compliant because I've tested, I've run an attack simulation and I've determined that for my use, this is safe. And we go back to this like privacy utility trade-off or you know, mm -hmm. security utility trade-off. And now I know that I need this data for X. And the resulting risk is why. And now I know at least how to protect and do access control or encrypt the database or whatever it might be in order to protect the risk that I now know more information about. Yeah. And back to that point, right? If you take the time to actually do privacy engineering in the initial or in the next gen implementation of whatever business process you've got, you could potentially lower that risk of this operation from like, hey, we got to touch a ton of red data to now, wow, because we've actually done this tokenization anonymization, now it's suddenly effectively yellow data. It's not nearly as sensitive, which means in many cases, less additional security controls are needed, right? You could potentially start to pull in contractors or other teams to be able to work on that data, right? Yep. So it's being able to take perspective of, yes, there's some initial pain, but there's all these really great benefits you get 
in the short term and even long term of going through this effort. I think that's what a lot of people lose sight around when they consider the trade-offs. You know what I mean? There's a lot of, absolutely. And I think the maturity of the tools around it now are making it a lot easier so that like the cost of privacy is getting lower. The the cost of architecting a system is getting lower. And the ones that we like the most that we've seen be on the forefront of this are using a remote dev environment company to build up and break down dev environments as needed for folks and then dumping anonymized data into those dev environments. So we have a direct connection in with a company Octeto so you can do a data snapshot. So a dev environment gets spun up, you select a source database that you want data to be dumped into your dev environment and anonymizes it and dumps it in. So that mm. that database gets built in a few minutes and now the, the developer can use that. And then when they're done with it, they break it down. So it becomes easier. But if you architect things that way, now you've enabled all of your engineers to have great environments that, that are pretty efficient, efficient for them to get going, but also it, it serves the, the security sort of policies that you're trying to build towards in the organization. Yeah. So threading back all these topics we've covered, I think one of the last questions I have for you, Graham, is there are certain technologies that are considered transformative. I would love to think privacy and data anonymization is transformative and makes all the headlines. But what seems right now to be dominating the headlines outside of cybersecurity is this concept of generative AI. You've heard about GPT-4 and chat GPT and heck, even stories where like doctors have taken confidential patient data, shoved it in through this large language model to auto-generate a letter to the insurance carrier to say, hey, please approve this procedure for my patients, you know, because they don't want to go through and write that legwork. It's mind boggling. And I think we're still kind of scratching the surface of what this technology can do. But even there, data anonymization, data tokenization plays a huge role in being able to use generative AI for a whole bunch of other use cases. I'm curious your thoughts here. Well, my first, my thought was spending three weeks trying to figure out how we could be the generative AI for privacy so we could raise our next round of funding a lot easier. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I quit thinking about that pretty fast. I do think we're like a tool that that is in a, a critical part of that. So I mentioned like your mother being able to re-identify you very quickly. Well, now mm-hmm. generative AI is very smart. So now we've got millions of people that know you as well as your mother. And I think it just becomes more important to make sure that the data that we're using to train those models isn't using unique, identifiable health information, for instance, because that's probably the biggest threat is that suddenly you have the power to combine all the information across the internet in two seconds to gain information about a subject and start to restitch. Like It's still pretty funny how fast you can sort of trick ChatGPT into telling you information that it initially says that it shouldn't. Um, <laughs> Yeah. But it's, it's kind of a fun little hack. But so, yeah, I, I think about us as like for training data and we see a lot of training data be used on this, but you really want to understand the level of re-identification risk that a database has if you're going to publish it for use in that context. Absolutely. I, I think we won't know the true impacts of this for the next couple of months, maybe even yeah. years. And a lot of us in the security space kind of can see the train, <laughs> You know, it might be miles away, but it's coming and it's a matter of, okay, can we convince them to get off the track or not actually there to have a a major disaster happen? I think that's the next thing that everyone's holding their breath is, does it need to be a reactive situation where something really bad needs to happen for people to wake up and realize, oh, there's all these great controls and tools that we could have used all along, or can we actually get ahead of it? I I don't know. I mean, I try to be optimistic, but then the pessimist in me is like, eh, it's, it's going to end up being a reactive situation. I don't know. The robots are taking over. The robots yeah. are definitely taking over. Well, yeah. thank you so much for your time today, Graham. This has been yeah. a pleasure talking with you. And it's been crazy to see how just all these different topics kind of thread together and how it all makes sense. A lot of fun. Glad to have the chat. Awesome. Well, tune in next week for another episode of The Threat Show. Hopefully our co-host, Chris Wilder, will be back to join us. In the meantime, to our audience, if you have any questions about what we covered today or other topics, or hey, you want to potentially join us as another guest speaker on the show, please DM us at The Threat Show. Thanks again and take care. See ya. Thank you for tuning into The Threat Show. If you enjoyed the show, subscribe to us on YouTube, give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, and interact with us on Twitter at The Threat Show. Also, 
Be sure to subscribe to Fletch's interactive newsletter and trending threats app to go deeper into the stories we discuss and the threat index. Be sure to stay tuned to stay ahead of threats.